Amen. 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 I'm certainly delighted again. I want to. I want to. Before I proceed, certainly want to welcome our YouTube audience. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are LifePoint Christian Faith Center, located at 12 21st Avenue in the city of Coralville, Iowa. We are a suburb of Iowa City, and uh, the best thing happening today is right here in the house of God. So we trust that you didn't tune in by by chance. If you're watching it later on YouTube. Just get something to write with. Open your heart and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you because we want you to know that Jesus loves you. He died for you and he's made all provisions for you. So anything that you don't have in life is not because he hasn't provided it. It's probably because you don't know about it. So we want you to know about all the things that God has pre prepared for you through Jesus Christ. Can you say amen and welcome our YouTube audience this morning? Amen. Come on. I also want to extend a welcome to uh, our first time guest. As I look around, I'm just looking around. Nobody the first time on this side. Uh, certainly delighted that for those of you here, we got some guests that have been here before in our old building. Uh, we're glad for you, and we trust that God has brought you here by his Holy Spirit. Uh, I think many times we take too much credit upon ourselves in terms of what we think that we were, are intended to do. And yet the Bible says that don't say that you're going to go here or go there except by the allowance of the Lord. Amen. So if you're here today and you're alive, do you pass the breath test? Take your hand, put it in front of your mouth and breathe. If it's warm, you pass. <laughs> Amen. You say, well, what if it's cold? I don't know. I can't help you there. I don't know. You got cold breath. I don't know. I'm not a fan of the snow. It has been it snowed yesterday. And those of you that are believing God for snow, you know, I'm just going to tell you, you need to repent. OK, <laughs> because I'm not feeling the snow and I know it's a part of nature. And yet we know it's there. But by the same token, I don't like it. It's cold. Amen. Praise God. We've been talking from the, the topic of. Um, knowing the potential, learning the potential in every seed. And here we are at the end of, my goodness, it's Thanksgiving on Thursday. Anybody else surprised by that? It kind of just snuck up, right? Y'all got plans for Thursday? Special plan? I hope so. But with that being said, man, I mean, I'm like, wow, it's really, the year has flown by, and we've been in this facility for a year now, a little over a year, and uh, I don't think we've lost anything. As a matter of fact, I think we've gained some things by being obedient to God. And trusting in him to do, the, to do the things that he said he would do. Amen. So with that, I want, to, I want to talk to you today about a topic that's close to my heart. Um, just hearing the Lord here for a minute. Just stay with me. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians 3. I'm sorry, Galatians 4, if you would, please. Galatians 4, if you would. Galatians 4. Thank you, Jesus. It'll be on the board if you don't have a Bible, but... If you have a tablet or a phone, whatever it is you're using, turn to Galatians, the fourth chapter. I want you to just hold your place there. And as you hold your place, the Lord has just laid some things on my heart. And I'm going to read it, but I don't know how much I'm going to read it. I'm, my desire and my endeavor is to get through, uh, to get through the, the, what God has given me in that regard for that. Let me Forgive me, I'm going to turn my phone off here, or at least put it on. Vibrate. Amen? If you have it, say amen. amen. All right, Galatians 4. Everybody, y'all quiet on this side now. Come on now. Come on, come on. Y'all wake? Y'all need coffee? Y'all need me to do some calisthenics? And... Okay, you get up and show us how. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. So, um, so, so with this, in Galatians 4, we've been talking to going through Galatians. Early on in the book of Galatians, what, what the Apostle Paul describes, give me 45 minutes, please, if I could. Uh, what the Apostle Paul describes, he, he starts out by talking to the Galatians as, as if they were children, right? In the beginning of the book, we talked about that. Where we are now, he's not talking to children anymore. He's talking more to the, I would say in our today's vernacular, preteen, adolescent group, those that, are, those that are on the verge of discovering who they really are. You know, when you get to be all 15, you know, your parents are just stupid. I mean, they're just stupid. They're just, they don't know anything. They, come on now, y'all, come on. I know I'm not the only one. Y'all can leave me hanging if you want to, but I know, I know better than that. You know, when we're about 15, 16, we know everything, and our parents know nothing. 
And, and yeah, yeah, see, y'all laughing. Okay, okay. Yeah, now y'all admitting to the truth. Amen. And so what happens, though, is that Paul begins to describe them in saying that, you know, it's okay to be inquisitive. It's, it's okay to be a child who doesn't know as much as you think you know. And so with that, the Apostle Paul begins to address some issues in the church. And I'm not going to go into all of them. You can read it for yourself. But there's something that I see that, that causes me to struggle uh, in, from my background of growing up in the Pentecostal Holiness Church very, with a very strict uh, parental guidance, as far as that were. I, I, I did not, as many of you know, acclimate to that. Rather, I rebelled against it, but I didn't know why I rebelled. And I, I thought that there was something wrong with me. Come on. Right? Many of us, we won't admit it because we're in a yeah. polished group. We won't admit that we think sometimes that something is wrong with us. Well, Isn't that right? Yeah. And so what happens, though, is I have to then understand that there is a greater force. There is a greater, greater power, a greater entity. We call his name God, Jehovah, Yahweh. He is the ever-present one, the omniscient. Um, come on now. He's that one who's there with me, governing my life, even when I don't think my life needs to be governed. Yes. And, you know, when you're 15, 16, you know, you are invincible. <laughs> you jump off a roof and go down a zip line. I wouldn't touch a zip line at 56, man. I don't care what you think about me. I, you know what I'm saying I'm just not that guy. But when I was younger, my struggle was not in so much identity, but rather with my struggle was with reality in terms of who he is. I didn't know who God was. Somebody's calling. Look at God calling in, man. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I've been waiting to use that one for a long time. About that. <laughs> so my struggle was not so much within my own personal conflict. Many people, they struggle with their own personal demons. And it's amazing that if I'm, if I'm dealing with my brother, Elder Bell, here, when I look at him, I, I, can, I can see his weakness, but I can't see mine. Well, and it's easy for me to pronounce over him, you got a devil, brother. You need to be, it need to be cast out. But when, it, when it's mine and I got the same issue, I'm just, God is just working on me. Huh? So, so, so the difference there is that a lack of understanding, not not so much in who I am, but who God is and his position of love concerning us. Amen. So when we get into Galatians here, we're in Galatians four. Let's let's skip down. Uh, let's read Galatians. I want to read it all of the fourth chapter, but I don't have time. So for the sake of time, let's read Galatians uh, 17. Can we start there? Four and 17. If you have it, say amen. He says that I'm reading from the expanded Bible. Those people are working hard to persuade you. Right. But this is not good for you. They want to persuade you to turn against us and follow only right them. In other words, they have their own agenda. Verse 18 says it is good for people to show interest in you, but only if their purpose is good. This is always true, not just when I'm with you. My, this is where I want to focus today. My little children. Again, say again. He says, again, I feel the pain of childbirth for you. Here's a man feeling the pain of childbirth without artificial insemination. He's struggling. Come on out. This is always true, not just when I'm with you, my little children. Again, I feel the pain of childbirth for you. And until you truly become like Christ. So, so today, our, my endeavor, my desire is to talk to you about becoming like Christ. It sounds simplistic. It sounds, it sounds like, you know, as we become like Christ, I think a lot of people are to the point where we think, again, when we judge somebody else, we judge them based on what we see rather than who they are. Jesus Christ is clearly the only, he's the high priest of our confession. He is the Zion's righteous governor. He is the one who ever lives to make intercession for us. He is the shepherd and bishop of our souls. He's so many titles. One of the ones I like is found over the book of Revelation. He is faithful and true. So when he assesses my life, he assesses it based on truth. Come on now, talk to me this morning. So with that being said, then why is it that I look at my brother and sister and want to judge them based on what? My limited knowledge says. 
This is important because it, it hinders the growth of our church. Not, only, not just, I'm not talking about life, I'm talking about the body of Christ, but also our personal lives. You know why people don't like to be around us? Because we're too critical. We're too judgmental many times. Many times we think we know more about them than they even know about themselves. I'm going to be honest with you. Can I be honest with you today? I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest anyway. I'm going to be honest with you. Here I am, 56 years old, soon we'll be 57. And I still, man, I'm learning stuff about God I just did not know 20 years ago. And I was in love with the Lord. I was a minister ordained into the ministry. I was called. I knew that. But I just didn't know the lengths that God would go to to make sure that I stay close to him. Yes. And, and, and with people, many times people... They're so quick to criticize and quick to judge. I heard somebody accuse me. I don't, I don't really want to share this, but I'm going to share it because I sense the Lord telling me to. Um, I was accused a few years ago, a couple years ago, of uh, being somebody who breaks up marriages. And yet I work hard to keep my marriage sound. Why would I, why would I, why would I have the energy or the desire to break up somebody's marriage? But their perception of me was that because, and I know where it comes from. Come on, y'all stay with me, right? Come on, we, we going somewhere. Y'all stay with me, right? Come on, y'all get on the treadmill. Come on, let's run. Come on, come on, come on. What they, what they saw was they saw me telling truth and, and misinterpreting it as me being divisive. The truth always demands a true response. It, the Bible doesn't say that you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Set you free. The Bible says the truth, you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Make you free. In other words, you don't have to acknowledge that it's truth. It's still going to make you free. So when people try to accuse me or you of doing things that are divisive, what they're doing is they're misinterpreting the plan of God for his people. Now, you understand that, right? So, so the premise is simply this. What God's desire to do in you is to form himself in you by Jesus Christ. Yes. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This one wasn't in my notes, but just turn there. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Ha. <laughs> Thank you, Father. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. When you have it, just hold it. Say amen. Put something in, in your Galatians, because I'm going to be back there. You have it? Your one, two yeses. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Let's, let's, let me start at verse 16. Verse 16, I'm reading from the ex, ex, Expanded Bible again. From this time on, we do not think of anyone as the world does. Right? In the past, we thought of Christ as the world thinks, but we no longer think of him in that way. If anyone belongs to Christ, does anybody here belong to Christ? Come on now. Do you belong to him? Yes. Do you really? Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. All right. So if anyone, uh, he says, belongs to Christ, there is a new creation. In other words, who you were before you accepted Jesus Christ, that person no longer exists. Amen. And many times when people examine your life, they look at the past of your, your past track record, you know, and they try to put you in the light of that past track, track record to be who you are right now. And you cannot be. Come on. You can't be both. Amen. That's like somebody saying, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. You can't be both. OK. All right. Let's keep going. The old things have gone. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Everything is made new. All this is from God who through Christ did what? Made peace between us and himself and did what? Gave us the ministry. Your King James Bible says. Uh, of reconciliation gave us the work of telling everyone about the new peace that we can have with him. If we want to be successful in the kingdom, the first thing we're going to have to do is recognize that our assignment is to tell everybody who we are and what Christ has done for us. Isn't that right? My wife and I this week, we had you guys blessed us with a uh, day away and we took advantage of that. And we had an opportunity to minister to a, a gentleman who was our limousine driver. I did say limousine. I can't remember the last time I was in limo. Uh, before Thursday. <laughs> so, yeah, I get that later. Anyway, so I'm like, whoa, this is cool. But as we got in the limo, he needed to hear about Jesus. And it just so happened, my wife prayed. She said, you know what? It'd be nice to have him as our return driver because he dropped us off. And sure enough, when we came downstairs at the, at the end of our, you know, when we were departing from the place, he was there. 
And, and I blessed him. Not just with word, but with money. Because <laughs> I know he heard more of what I had to say when I handed him that bill in his hand. Come on now. Uh, be real spiritual if you want to. Money answereth all things, the Bible says. So anyway, so we ministered to him and I was telling him about how good God is and how he's been to me. Now, I, I didn't tell him it wasn't about me. It was just simply testifying to him because he started sharing some things regarding what was going on in his life. And, and I say that because each one of us has the ability to minister peace and reconciliation to people. Yeah. It's just been given to you. You don't you don't have to work it up. All you have to do is show up. Amen. Isn't that right? Yeah. Just show up somewhere Amen. and look around like, God, oh, why you got me here? I don't even like coffee. Why am I in the coffee house? Hey. Because he's got a plan. <laughs> because he's got a plan for somebody in the coffee house. Amen. So let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay. Y'all got that, right? So we have the ministry of reconciliation. Turn back to Galatians for me, please. Hallelujah. Boy, Father, I sent you presence here. So in Galatians, Paul is saying to the people that I told you a couple weeks ago, the last time I stood before you, was that these people were not as bad and contemptible as the Corinthians. But they were right there underneath. And the Galatian people, the Galatian presence was so that they did, they were willing to do anything because they were so hungry for knowing who they were. They, come on now, you got to stay with me. It wasn't that they were knowing, wanting to know who God was because they didn't know who Jesus Christ was. They didn't know that Jesus Christ was a redeemer, a savior, a deliverer, a healer. They didn't know. And honestly, they didn't care. But what they wanted to know was what is the significance of Jesus Christ to me? Isn't that the real question? If you don't know the significance of Jesus Christ to you, then how are you going to tell somebody else? Right. Right. Let me go over here. Maybe I'll get... If you don't know that Jesus came to give you life and that more abundantly and in the package of his coming was healing, deliverance, salvation, vindication. Come on, somebody. Elevation, promotion, prosperity, the deliverance of your grandchildren and your children's children. Then you will be quiet on God and God can only do so much through you because you are too quiet on him. And God wants us to be vocal. He wants us to, to, to take his blessing that we find in Galatians 3.19, the blessing that is on you, because the Bible says that the curse has been eradicated because Jesus hung on the tree. Right? That why? That the blessing of Abraham. God, I wish I had time to talk about the blessing of Abraham. Would come upon us. There is no sickness in the blessing of Abraham. There is no poverty in the blessing of Abraham. I, there is only love, healing, salvation in the blessing of Abraham. Because God only had one blessing to give. <laughs> and he gave it to Abraham. And the Bible says he gave it to Abraham by what? Abraham by what? Faith. And it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Amen? Turn over with me to Ephesians 4, please. Ephesians the fourth chapter. I'm going to ask you a question in just a minute. And I know you'll be truthful with it because that's who you are. You're truthful people. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, bless you, Father. You know, many times I, I, I want to preach, but, you know, I, I, I know that teaching does more for your edification than preaching. Yeah. And when the Apostle Paul begins to talk to um, the saints, he begins to tell them, listen, that you need to be taught. There's things I want to share with you, but he says you are still too what? Carnal. Immature. Amen. Ephesians 4. Verse 14. If you have it, say amen. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to read from the King James Version here. These things are related, so I want to give them to you. He says here, the Apostle Paul is the writer. He's still the author, so the same author. He says that we henceforth, or from this time forward, be no more what? Children. Look up at me for a minute. If I were to pull, come here, Zach. If I were to pull Zach and have him stand right here, and we were to do a comparison, just face the people. If I were to stand here, and he and I side by side, how many of you didn't know his name was Zach before I just said it? I want you to be honest. 
There we go. I, honestly. OK, so we got a few. Now, stay with me. That's a great illustration. OK, so you don't know where he's at spiritually. Now, you think you know where I'm at spiritually because I stand up before you every Sunday. But the reality of it is, is the only one that really knows where we're at. So so in, in God, there's no distinguishing. There's no distinction between he and I. With God, he is the same God that works in Zach's life to bring about Zach's prosperity, Zach's success, yeah. Zach's deliverance, yeah. Zach's healing, Zach's wholeness, Zach's mama's wholeness, Zach's daddy's wholeness, and it is Tommy Roberts, and you don't know either one of us. But if I were to stand here with this man of God, how quick would we be to criticize because he and I are just holding hands? So some of y'all get that later. <laughs> Must be something funny going on. How you going to hold another man's hand in church? So we look at each other from the distinction of our own humanity rather than seeing that God has given us the ability to see as he sees and to discern as he discerns and to call those things that be not as though they were. Amen. So with God, so here in Ephesians 4, he says, his desire is that we no longer be more be children. Children, <laughs> we had our grandkids over yesterday. I love my babies. And that youngest, well, next to youngest male child, you're blessed, named Dominic. Boy, that little joker is fast. And he, uh, he can be a little, 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 I am careful with my words here, a little challenging sometimes. He, liked he was pulling on his older sister's stuff yesterday. And I was like, little boy, if you don't let go, at, at, at least you think he moved? He didn't buck. He wasn't intimidated by Papa's words. So I moved a little bit closer. I said, boy, if you don't let go. He looked at me a little questionable then, but he still held his little grip. Uh-huh. And then I moved, made a move where I was standing up and he let go. That's how we do with God. Or at least we think we do. God tells us what to do and then we respond many times too slow. <laughs> indifferently. Rebelliously. And we just don't respond at all. Some of us sometimes. And we think somehow or another God is still. Look, I'm telling you about God. God has already stepped as close as he going to step to you. And given you as much power as he going to give you. But you have to obey at some point. <laughs> Isn't that right? And that little boy, he, he obeyed reluctantly, but he did obey. So what is my point here? My point is that what are we doing? We are growing up into him. I'm a little ahead of myself, but I'm going to go ahead. Let me pick on anybody. Somebody give me a Bible character. One of your favorites. Come on. Quick, quick, quick. Paul. I heard Paul first and I heard Dave. Let's look at Paul for a minute. If, if, if I were to take you and bring you into a room where, where there is uh, uh, very little spirituality, which is what our world is right now. Okay. And we place Paul here and you here. With Paul, maybe they can go back and look at some of like they do our Supreme Court justices and look at some of their intellectual writings and their their their, their reviews and various things. So they're looking at the life of Paul and they're seeing Paul and they think, wow, he wrote this, this, this and this. Uh, but, 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 but wait a minute. In, 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 in Acts 4, I, 3, I see something a little unusual about Paul. Paul was consenting unto the death of Stephen, holding the garments. What's that all about? So then all of a sudden, my, my, my analytical, you know, in, intellectual, gifted mind somehow or another cast aspersions against Paul. And I'm not really all that impressed with Paul, but yet he's done. But wait a minute, he's written most of the New Testament. Now I put you in here and you with your little happy self, you've been born again for about six months and and you don't know diddly and you think you know more than that. And you are here all of a sudden. All you know is I love Jesus. And anytime worship goes on, you're right there. Anytime somebody tells you to speak the word, you're there. You're learning how to express yourself in God. But side by side to the people, the people see you as Paul being an intellectual gifted man who has 
a challenge or a fault and you are just a novice but something about you stands out and distinguishes who you are can I tell you that in the eyes of God there is no difference at all but in the eyes of people people would see you and think that somehow or another you are not the same as Paul but God never called you to be the same as Paul he called you to be who you are and be the best that you are called to be the Bible says Writing, even before that, he says, henceforth or from this time forward, know we no man after the flesh. Isn't that right? So here in Ephesians, we see that what happens is with people, we start acclimating to whatever we're taught. In other words, there is the word doctor means what? Teaching. Y'all know this, Right. The word doctrine means teaching. So whatever I teach you or you're taught by somebody else, you think somehow or another that 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 it's it's insignificant. But I'm going to tell you, it's it's where you are in life right now. Give me another character. David. I'm going to use David. How many of you would think that David was spiritually mature? I don't know. You're like, I don't know if I should raise my hand or not. He might call on me. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. That's a good question. He said, what time of his life? Because because, you know, come on now. And that's a great point, because, see, we look at David now. The, the, clearly, clearly, Jesus is of the line of David. Y'all do know that G, that David, his his his. <laughs> I got to be careful. Got kids in. David slept with somebody that wasn't his wife, which made him an adulterer. He's an adulterer. And. The baby that was conceived died. Help me, somebody. And then in his death, God raised up another child, which was Solomon. And so God had the bloodline of David through Bathsheba. David was an adulterer. Bathsheba was an adulterer. David was a murderer. And yet God did not stop the, 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 the presence or the coming of Jesus through this bloodline because God doesn't look at what you do. He looks at who you are. And so the question that must be asked is, who are you? This is my son, our oldest son. I don't know who he is. He lives with me. I mean, he used to. I ain't saying nothing prophetic, okay? I'm just saying. <laughs> he got his own house he and his wife and that big happy baby boy back there and Madison who's wherever she is in the kids point I don't know him I don't know Crystal but they are related to me the only way for me to know them is to receive revelation of who they are how do I really receive revelation of people somebody tell me you're going to show me. And what else are you going to do? What else are you going to do? Don't talk. So when you start talking, I get insight to who you are. I can see him and I can say, you know what? By appearance, you know, you look like me. Whatever. You know what I'm saying? You, stop it. Yeah. He said you've been there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we got the same name. He's got a little different uh, suffix than I do. But the reality of it is, is I don't know them. That's why the Apostle Paul writes. He says, you know, from this time forward, we don't know anybody after the flesh. But then he says, listen, please help me. I don't care what you're doing. I, I got to be careful because the speaker. I don't care what you did last night. Because, see, ultimately, he says it about himself, and I'm going to get there in just a minute. Christ, say this with me, Christ, Christ is, being is being formed in me. David, who the manifestation of the person of Christ was not, was not literal, but figurative, spiritually, come on. Christ was being formed in him. What is, the, what is, Christ, what is Christ interpreted? Is the anointed one. And is anointing. In other words, I know you look good this morning. I know you dressed up real good and you love Jesus. Do you love him? Yeah. Come on, lift your hands. Tell him you love him. Come on. Come on, do it with me. I'm not, this is not spectator. This is not, we, Jesus, I love you. 
I love you so much because you've done so much for me. I pray that you are pleased with what I offer to you right now, today. Each one of our hearts is open to you. Come on, come on, thank him. Oh, Jesus, you're so special. You're so lovely. You're so wonderful. Thank you. Amen. But he's the only one that knows what's really going on inside of you. So David, Christ was being formed in. Paul, Christ was being formed in. Give me one more. Come on, give me one more. Give me a modern day one. Since the 1900s. Give me another one. Or Roberts. Who said that? Or Roberts. Just, just, by the way, in May of 2019, thank you for the segue and the commercial. You didn't know this, but I know this. In May of this year, uh, or, uh, Richard Roberts will be in Cedar Rapids. And I'm inviting, I'll tell you more about it as we go. Uh, I had an opportunity um, a couple weeks ago when we were in Texas to go back. I, the Lord told me to. He said, I want you to go back there and, and talk to or, uh, Richard Roberts. Or Roberts has been gone for a few years now. And um, so I did. I went and talked to him and told him that I was, thanked him for coming to Iowa. Because not everybody's coming to Iowa. That's right. And uh, I told him that we'll be there to support your ministry in life. Thank you so much. I met, or, I met I keep saying, or, I met Richard Roberts for the first time in a, in a grocery store in Tulsa, Oklahoma, back in 19, uh, uh, 1997, I think it was, yeah. And I walked up an aisle, and there he and Lindsay are walking. And I was like, Dad, he's just a real man. But at that time, he was president of the uh, Oral Roberts University and, and had a lot of things going on. He has a past. He had some things going on. But anyway, uh, love his ministry, enjoy it, and I'm really blessed by it, so I hope you will be as well. But, but he mentioned Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts, for those anybody that doesn't know who Oral Roberts was, because that, that'll save me some time. Anybody who does not know who Oral Roberts was? Everybody knows who Oral Roberts was? Okay, let me have something to drink. Uh, Oral Roberts, uh, as the, the forerunner of, of the healing ministry, thank you, uh, healing ministry in the United States of America used to have crusades that would have 40 to 50,000 people for several days. You could see him at, at some point he came on TV. And so Oral Roberts, but I was listening to his son was talking about Oral Roberts and he, his dad, uh, he just related this a couple weeks ago, his dad would have uh, uh, tell people that if you came in for healing, we will pray for every last one of you. And, and many times there were five to six thousand people that stayed for healing. And he laid his hands on every single person. Amen. Now that's good. But how I many you know that one person will get worn? And then he told the backstory was that he would go home. They would pour him, literally almost pour him into the car. And three or four days later, he would emerge because it took him that long to recover. How many of you know that's not God's best? How about if you and I, as people of God, lay hands on each other? How about if you're taught that you know that you are the priest of your own life? Right? That you speak healing in your house, not Tommy Roberts, not Oral Roberts. <laughs> Richard Roberts said, man, we must be related somewhere down the line. We got the same last name, whatever. <laughs> kind of looked at my skin and thought, mm. <laughs> I'm just saying. But my point is that Oral Roberts, how many of you know that Christ was being formed in him? Yes. Isn't that right? So, so we cannot discount the fact and the truth of what God is doing based on what we see. Turn, turn over with me. Uh, to, where did I take you last? Where was the last place? Ephesians 4? Turn over to Col Colossians, please. Colossians 1 and 27. Colossians 1, 27. Y'all all right? Thank you, Jesus. Colossians 1. Hallelujah. When you get it, say amen. You know, it's, 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 it's tough um, pastoring anyway, but it's tough pastoring in, 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 this, in this current environment um, for a, a multitude of reasons. For one, people are way too sensitive. And they think anytime you say something that you're talking about them, well, that's not a new story. That's been around for a long time. You know, um, Holy Spirit is the one, when Holy Spirit speaks, Holy Spirit tells you who you are and what you need to know. Say amen to that. So Colossians 1, um, let's see, I'm going to see what scripture I want to look at here. Let's look at, uh, yeah, I said 20, 27, but let, let's, let's go, I want to go a little bit deeper. Go to um, verse 22 for me, if you would, please. Colossians 1, 22, if you have a say amen. amen. Who, who's the writer of Colossians? 
Okay. So we got the same guy writing both letters, right? Verse 22. But now God has made you his friends again. Isn't that interesting? He reconciled you. Remember what we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You have been given the ministry of reconciliation because God had the ministry of reconciliation first. He says he friends again through Christ's death to the body. Oh, excuse me. Death in the body or the physical body, the body of his flesh, so that he might bring you into God's presence as people who are holy. Come on, wait a minute now. Wait, 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 wait. Look at me. Wait a minute. Wait, are you suggesting that through Christ's death, I'm made automatically holy? You absolutely are. The people that get in trouble is the one who try to add to their holiness. The people who get in trouble are the people who, add to, who try to add to their righteousness. You can't do it. It's impossible. Right. Same writer. Paul says that your our righteousness is as what? Filthy rags. He says uh, presence is people who are holy with no wrong. Ooh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You mean to say that when I accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I there's no wrong in my life. Please say amen to that. Amen. If you don't know that, you're going to struggle in your Christianity. When you come to lay hands on somebody, when you come to bring deliverance to somebody, when God uses you to speak to somebody a prophetic word or just a word of comfort, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, you will struggle if you don't know that in Christ you have been made his righteousness. <laughs> a lot of people say, well, I don't feel it. Nobody asked you to feel it. He didn't qualify this feeling. He said, that's who you are. And that's that's significant, especially in a church like this, because we got people from all, all walks, colors, creeds. You know what I'm saying? And, and the reality of it is, is that we don't all walk the same path. When I go out here, when I face my day, I don't know what you're doing, what you're encountering. But if you're at the university, you're facing something. If you're out and you're in the marketplace, maybe you work for an employer, you're facing something. If you're a student, you're facing something. But reality is you are still the righteousness of God. And it is when we think less because the devil is bombarding us with thoughts. Imagine the life. Who do we say first of, of Paul? Paul constantly had to fight the battles of him being the one who held the coat of Stephen. And people reminded him that you are. Listen, you are a murderer, a killer, killer. You have killer. You have uh, you have tormented us. And yet God said he's righteous. David, 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 David is a, David is all the things I said before. And David is, he's this, but yet he's a king. But he's a king and there's a kid in him because the kid in him wants to pursue a lust of his flesh. And yet in his kingship, <coughs> excuse me, he does not realize many times that he is the forerunner of Jesus prophetically. The, the throne of God has been established by the house of David who was so insufficient in his flesh that he writes the 51st Psalm, you need to read it another time, and declares that he must have God cleanse him and make him whole and righteous again. And then we talked about Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts is not listed in this book, but isn't he? He is. In theory, prophetically he's here. I don't know what Oral Roberts did. I remember hearing one story about Oral Roberts. <laughs> Or Roberts used to sit, go to a restaurant and he'd sit in the restaurant and he'd leave Evelyn and the kids had to sit at another table because he was preparing to do what God called him to do. Yeah, Pastor Annette ain't going for that one. <laughs> Some of y'all wives in here, you ain't going for it either. You ain't that holy, my friend, you know. But but that's the price that he was willing to pay <laughs> based on what God said for him to do. Amen. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> let me let me read verse 25. I be, verse 25 says I became a servant of the church because God gave me a special work to do that helps you. And that work is to do what? Tell fully. The message. That's what I'm endeavoring to do to you today. You know, I, I woke up this morning. I was uh, doing some things last night, and I didn't really have a clear sense of guidance what the Lord wanted to do. But he told me, I mean, he gave me a place to turn and places to turn. And Why? Because he's trying to expand your thinking as it concerns the message. Stop being so rigid in your thinking. Mm. 
Okay, let me keep going. I'm running out of time. He says, verse, verse uh, 26 says, this message is the secret that was hidden from everyone since the beginning of time. What is it? But now it is made known to, to God's holy people. Verse 27, God decided to let his people know this rich and glorious secret which he has for all people, right? This secret is what? That Christ lives in you. Come on, say it with me. Christ lives in me. Now say it this way. The anointed one and his anointing lives in me. So we continue. He is, excuse me, he is our hope for glory or Christ in you, the hope of glory. Turn with me to uh, 2 Peter 3.18. Got a few more and I'm going to let you go. 2 Peter 3.18. When you get it, say amen. Y'all quiet. I know y'all quiet because y'all are just listening, right? Amen. 2 Peter. 318. So if you start going back from where you were, you'll get to Hebrews for Second Timothy, Hebrews, keep on going. You'll get to First Peter, go on to Second Peter. Stop at chapter three and look down to first eighteen. Thank you, Father. How much time I got? Thank you, Lord. You got it? Okay. Give me 10 more. All right. Peter writes. Think about Peter for a minute. Nobody mentioned him. Peter was brash, presumptive, assumptive. What else said something? Impulsive. He was a liar. He was afraid. Have I hit any of y'all here in this audience? Because I done already hit me about four times now. He was uncertain. He was kind of proud. Probably of good stature. Stubborn. Violent. He was a lot of things, yo. And with all that he was, Peter was being formed in Christ. Remember when Jesus turns to him? Peter just answered the question, thou art, uh, Matthew 13, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Sounded good, felt good. Peter probably thought, mm -hmm, I got one over on my buddies. And then shortly thereafter, Jesus turns to him and says, get thee behind me, Satan. Yes. Why? Because Jesus understood. He didn't say get thee behind me, Peter. Right. He said get behind me, Satan. Yes. Because he understood that Peter was still being developed in Christ. If we understood this, we'd be less critical of the brothers and sisters that we sit next to us. If we understood this, we'd stop talking about how sh short her skirt is. If we understood this, we'd talk about, stop talking about how inconsistent people are. And with that, what we do is we would give the capacity. I wish I had time. In, in, in the writing of Paul, uh, Paul here to the church of Galatia, what he's doing as he transitions us from babies to, to uh, uh, adolescence, what he's doing is he's telling us that we have the greater capacity now to stop being slaves and start being sons and daughters. I told you guys a couple weeks ago, growing up in my daddy's house, my mama's house, growing up in their house, I was the youngest of, of eight children. My oldest brother is 11 years older than me. He had 11 years on me to figure out how it works in the Robert's house. Yes. And, and many of us, we want to look through, a, through, a, through a, a lens of criticism at people who have not had the same opportunity as you have to be able to mature in Christ. So we look critically and say, well, you know, they don't even do this. But I heard this come out of their mouth. Well, listen, baby, first of all, you are not the mouth police. Second of all, look at your own breath before you start judging somebody else's. Third of all, recognize that it is, it is Christ that is working in my brother or my sister that is bringing them to a place of maturity. And if you are still critical, you're probably not as mature as you think you are. <laughs> Second Peter. Let me, let me hurry up because I'm running out of time. All right. So. 
What did I tell you? Second Peter three, right? Eighteen. All right. Let me get there and I'll read it real quick. Second Peter three, verse eighteen from the expanded Bible. Glory to God. Amen. He says here. He says, but grow. And I'm not trying to take this out of context. So you read verse seventeen, but I'm going to keep. But grow in the grace, right? Come on, don't read over it. Grow in the grace. The grace is that you and I are not perfect. The grace is that I don't have every answer for every question. The grace is that I don't even know how I got out of the bed this morning to get my body dressed and washed up to come to be presentable. But there's something supernaturally working on the inside of me and on the outside of me that only God controls. It is his grace that keeps you alive. It is his love that persuades you that Jesus Christ is coming again. It is called grace. It is grace that your house doesn't fall apart when you know you haven't done everything right. It is grace that keeps your finances vibrant and productive even though you know you haven't tithed in six months. It is his grace. So what are we called, commanded to do by Paul? By Peter, he says, grow in it. Understand that I know that 25 years ago, brother, I was just learning about God, but I have learned something about God now. He don't break my leg to heal it. Come on, somebody. He didn't touch my finances to prove that he is Jehovah Jireh. He is just God all by himself. He loves me. He loves me right where I am right now. Call the incident control unit and let them know that Tommy Roberts, you put your own, is not perfect. But my God, God loves me. Getting too happy, lost my place. So, but growing grace, he says, and what? In the knowledge. In other words, I'm supposed to enlarge my capacity to understand. Isn't that what knowledge is? Yeah. Yeah. Knowledge is coming to you all, you know, hmm. You learn knowledge through, the, through your physical senses. Hmm, a mama might say, Something doesn't, I smell gas. And while you're smelling gas, you might, you know, it, you might feel it's a little cold in here and, and, and while you're doing that you might watch visually as something is crossing in front of your path and this great intellectual capacity that God has given you you can do all these things at the same time because you're growing in knowledge but the reality of it is is this knowledge is sensual but the spirit knowledge is greater and brings us to a place of maturity that I don't have to when somebody corrects me elder day I don't have to be upset because they corrected me I don't have to be mad because they didn't wear a suit today. Mm, God help me. Because <laughs> why? I'm growing. Tell your neighbor you're growing. <laughs> I'm growing. Let me finish this verse. He, so he says here. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Lord. Thank God for Bibles. Amen. He says, but growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, not just Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. Glory be to him now and forever to the day of eternity. Amen. Turn with me to Philippians 2. I got two more scriptures here for you. Are you all right? Yes. Philippians, the second chapter. Thank you, Jesus. Mm, hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. Philippians, the second chapter. And let's turn to um, verse 12. When you have it, say amen. amen. Philippians 2, verse 12 through 14. So I'm going to read this from the NIV just for sake of reading and your understanding. Who's writing? Okay, Paul again. He says, do everything without, what does your Bible say? Murmuring. Murmuring, arguing. Crumbling, a uh, grumbling or complaining. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out what? How many of your Bibles say your own salvation? Okay. Listen to me well. Look up at me. It is not your responsibility to work out somebody else's salvation. And when you try, you may, listen, when you try to work out somebody else's salvation, salvation, you make your own salvation deficient. 
It was never God's design. Stand up. It was never God's design, although he's my son, for me to try to. And, and listen, I'm going to tell you all the reality of this. When he became 18, his mother and I already knew that he was more God's than he was ours. I'm going to help some parents here. Because, see, I got you. He, as accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, has his own path to walk. And it may not intersect with mine. It may take him a long way around to get to where I am right now. But that's not my call. So if I make the mistake of saying, boy, you need to get saved. Boy, you need to give your heart to y'all. I'm using that word boy intentionally because, you know, y'all know not y'all, but you know how some of y'all on YouTube land can be. Y'all condescend to your children and they groan. And they get tired of hearing your mouth because your mouth has not grown up to get to where you think you are. And they are already surpassing you. That's why they don't pay no attention to you. So my response should be, son, how you doing? How you doing? <laughs> How's everything going? Now, I'm not asking for a physical response. I'm asking for a spiritual response because I've given him credit for being born again. And if you've been in this church, y'all know good and well, y'all don't talk about your feelings. In other words, his path to where God has me might, like I said, take him around a path that I never had to go on. But you can sit down. But, but clearly, it's not my path. It's God's. Yes. And what I want to do is I want to sit down with Mike and make Mike's path my path. Mike, you got to pray in the Holy Ghost for 20 minutes a day. Mike, you got to uh, put on a suit. I love that Paisley shirt. Now, that's a good looking shirt. No, that's really good. I told you that earlier. That's a nice shirt. I'm going to have to see if I can find me one. What size is it? Can I wear it? Can I have it? <laughs> I can't wear it. Don't give it to me. I know you would. But, Mike, if you really want to be used by God, you got to start wearing a tie. You know. Amen. Mary Lou, God loves you. He'd love you more if you had a dress on to your, to your feet. <laughs> Brother David, God loves you, but he don't love you in pinstripes. <laughs> what am I doing? I'm trying to bring them along a path that I had to figure out on my own. How dare I impose my, my path, my will on somebody else? So when I see somebody who's coming up short, <laughs> instead of being critical and figuring out, well, they just don't love God quite enough. <laughs> God, I both said that. You have to understand you might be the one that ain't figured out that you don't love God enough. Amen. And let them go with your mouth. Let me give you a couple more scriptures. I'm done. Can I give you, what I need you, Philippians 2? Right? He goes on to say, therefore, my dear friends, you have always obeyed, not only in my presence and now much more in my absence, continue to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, reverential fear and trembling. For it is God, this is where I was trying to, for it is God who does what? Works in you, both to will, and King James says to do, this one says, and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. In other words, you wake up in the morning, we take too much credit for ourselves. I started off by saying, I'm gonna say it now as I get ready to conclude. You are not really in charge of your own life. Yes, you have a will. Yes, you have the authority and the permission to say no. God will never override your ability, your desire. He's not going to do it. He's not going to make you pray. He's not going to make you give. He's not going to make you uh, spend quality time and intimacy with. He is not going to do it. The Holy Ghost is not going to use your vocal cords unless you open your handsome mouth and start praying to him. He is not going to do it. But it is God who stands there. Come here. It is God who stands. Turn around, face step. As, as I am representative of God, it is God, the Bible says, who worketh in you to do and to will. In other words, not only do I give him the capacity to do, I give him the desire to continue to love me. Even though he goes through hard times, even though things aren't lining up the way he thinks they should be, love comes from God because he is love. So he never leaves me alone. In other words, he's whispering in my ear. He's speaking by the Holy Ghost. The angels of the Lord are encamped round about him. Less than any time he, by God help me. He's doing all of these things, but it is because it is God who worketh 
both to do and to will. We can't just stop with to do. We have to have the will. The will of God is that sometimes, you know what? You don't feel like you are a overcomer. But the will of God is that, Tommy, you are an overcomer. I know, I know, I know, I know it don't feel like it. I know, God, help me. Woo, if, I, if, if I had to come to church based on my feeling, we would, I would not be here most days. If I had to serve, if I had to worship him, if I had to go out and tell somebody based on my feelings, it would not happen. But somehow or another, I have not forgotten that the Apostle Paul, just like he prayed for the Galatians, the heavenly high priest Jesus is ever living to make an intercession for me. He's saying, Tommy, get up. You can do it again. You can face another day. Just because your bank account is zero now, it won't always be that way. Yes, I know they said that you are sick and that you're going to die. But raise up, son, and call those things that be not as though they were. I'm with you. Turn to Philippians 3 and we're finished. Thank you, Father. I know, man. <laughs> Good God, I know, I know, I know. Shoot. <laughs> Ooh, God, take it out of my shoulders. Man, I, I, I don't know how to say it. I just kind of, mm, I know it. I know it. I don't feel it. I know 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 it. I mean, I really do know it. Hmm. And so, this writer, and I'm going I'm to I'm expedite you through this. It's going to be a speed session here real quick. The Apostle Paul comes to the Galatian church and he says, okay, you, I'm called to you. I am summoned to you to divinely impart into you something that you don't know. I'm telling you who you are. I'm telling you why you are that way. I'm telling you why you can't figure out why every time you try to do good, things don't happen good for you. Every, you, you, you you've acclimated to the message of the gospel and now there's some people who've come in and told you that the gospel is not necessary, but I'm here to tell you that it is the gospel of God, the Bible says, that leads men to repentance. So the gospel is absolutely necessary. Don't be swayed. Don't be caught off guard by people people that don't don't really have your best interest at heart understand that I was the one who went down on my knees on my face before God I fasted I prayed I went into intercession for you because I knew that you were a bad you had a bad heritage you had a bad last name you had bad people in your family you had liars and robbers and killers and the Bible says such were some of you I know but I'm praying for you because I know that the day is coming when Christ will be formed in you in other words he will grow in you and you will raise up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You will be mature even if it takes you a lifetime. You're going to get there, baby. And Paul says, I am there for you. And in being there for them, that meant that he had to go on the mat for them. That meant he had to go lay down his own inadequacies and his own insecurities and say, God, I know that I used to, I was there the day Stephen was stoned. I was there taking the warrants before the magistrates and saying that the people weren't worthy. Let me kill them. But God, you, you, you knocked me down on the Damascus road. So now I fall on my face and I say, what will you have me to do? You want me to go to Galatia? I'll go to Galatia. I'll deal with them. What do you want me to say to them? Remind them remind them that there was once a slave and his and, and it was Hagar and I'm getting way ahead of myself but Hagar was a slave and yet there was a better promise made unto you Galatian people you don't know <coughs> but it was made promise of God made to you that through through the death on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ you would be delivered from sin and sickness and the curse of the law so now what you have to do is you got to believe you got to change your thinking can I please church change your thinking mm. I saw somebody smoking the other day they were sinning no how do you know that well they were smoking Show me in the word where it says because they're smoking, they're a sinner. I know you're not that your Bible is a temple, your body is a temple. I know that. Stop it. Stop it. Close your Bibles. Close your Bible. Why? Because, because ultimately, you know, well, I saw them and, and, you know, and they were out at the club last night. Well, first of all, what were you doing? And how'd you know you were? So if you saw them, you had to be in close proximity. How come you weren't home reading your Bible? You so holy. I 
I, 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 saw, I saw so-and-so with another woman. It might have been his sister. Did you bother to ask? <laughs> Why do I say that? Because, see, what you've forgotten is that Christ <laughs> is being formed in them. And they may not be where you are, and I'm not sure I want to be where you are. But wherever they are is under the watchful tutorial eye of the Holy Ghost. And he would say to them, listen, 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 baby. You can't keep doing this if you want to get closer to me. Mm. It, it, Paul says, let him that steal, steal no more. Let him that lie tell the truth. You, you can't be a, a, a womanizer and be in Christ too. You got to make a decision, but, but in your process of making the decision, in your young mind as it were, and I submit to you that after 25 years of serving the Lord, my mind is still young. I'm still learning how to submit who I am to God and allow God to bring forth his glory in me so that people can see the goodness of God in the church. Help me somebody. And in, 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 the, in the midst of it, and I'm not condoning sin in any level, None. But I recognize that if had not been for the Lord on my side. Because Christ is still being formed in me. You may say, well, <coughs> I feel like they should be doing they should know more. It's like having a two year old in your house. You know, I said this yesterday. I was kidding, but I said it yesterday. Dominic, our grandson, is going on three now. He's two and a half. And my wife and I heard this joke years ago. Uh, it's a, it's a, what's his name? What's the black comedian's name? Michael, Michael Jr. Jr. Michael Jr. If you ever want to laugh, re listen to Michael Jr. on YouTube. Michael Jr. said, he told his son, you've been here four years and you don't know nothing. <laughs> I said that to Dominic yesterday, Elder Kelly. Dominic, you've been here two and a half years, you don't know nothing. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? Then why do we look at somebody and look and say, well, you've been in the church six months, a year, two years, three years, four years, ten years. And you're still struggling with that? Ah, because Christ is being formed. <laughs> Listen, I say to you, I say to, I'm going to say to TJ, just because my son, you know, he's real close and we're, we're, he works in the office with us and everything. Is TJ see me doing something? He just say, well, you know what? You know, I heard your dad was this and I heard your dad was this. And all TJ's response is, well, Christ is still being formed in him. Is that an excuse or is that truth? That's one. That's one. Philippians three, Philippians three. Don't open your Bibles. Don't don't even give it give it up on the board for him, please. Philippians three. I'm gonna close with this. It's twelve on one. Okay, I'm out of time. Thank you for your grace. <laughs> Ooh, I didn't run out of words. Y'all you know I ain't never run out of words. Dang, dang. But Elder Day be talking about the fifth closing and all that kind of stuff. You know, I'm just saying. But but this is so important to what we're trying to do and what we're trying to convey this morning as part of the message. Philippians 3, very familiar passage of scripture. You guys know this one. Anybody can quote, without your Bible being open, can quote Philippians 3, 14. Anybody? I got a cookie for you. <laughs> About all I got. Other than add a boy. Philippians 3. Oh, blessed Jesus. Come on, come on, lift your hands in the presence of the Lord. Would you do that? Come on, lift your hands. Come on, lift your hands. Lift your hands. Lift your hands in the presence of the Lord. Let's just worship him. Father, we just worship you. We thank you, Jesus, for being good to us. We thank you for your love and your kindness, which is better than life. Thank you, God, that you've already figured out what tomorrow's going to hold. Thank you that you've already figured out the evening plans. We think we're going to do one thing, but you've already got a plan. Thank you, Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we're going to listen to you and do what you tell us to do and not just what we feel like doing. God, I thank you. I thank you that you're going to bring people across our lives. Thank you. Thank you that you trust us with the message enough to have us encounter people that are not necessarily, that do not necessarily make us feel comfortable. Thank you for that, because we're going to give you glory. If you agree with that, come on, give, give the Lord a hand in praise. <laughs> Philippians 3, last scripture. Last scripture. Philippians 3, verse 14. I'm just going to read, not trying to take it out of context. The Apostle Paul writes here, he says, I keep trying to to reach the goal and get the prize for which God called me to the life above. Give me the King James version up there if you haven't already up there. He says, I keep trying to reach, come on now, pursuing or chasing the goal 
and get the prize for which God called me to the life above or heavenward. He says through or in Christ Jesus. Now, you guys know this better as I press toward the mark or the goal. That's not King James. That's something else. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Christ in Christ Jesus. Give me, give me King James Version. That's how I want to close. Put it on up there. King James Version. Y'all know this. Amen. So I submit to you that everybody in this building today, those that are watching on, let me know when it's up. There. Those that are watching by YouTube, live stream or later on, each one of us are pressing toward the mark of the high calling, which is found only in Christ Jesus. If Paul can write it and Paul can say it with confidence, we should be able to do the same thing. Doesn't mean that you figured it out. You know? He says, I press. Come on, read it with me. Would you do that? Come on. One, two, wait a minute. One, two, three. I press toward the mark for the what? Prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There's a higher calling no matter where you are. If you're 80 years old, there's a higher calling. If you're 65, there's a higher calling. If you're sick in your body, there's a higher calling. If you're broke in your pocketbook, there's a higher calling. If you're, your relationships are dysfunctional, there's a higher calling. So what you and I are called to do is press. Push aside obstacles. Come on, let's let your body stand to your feet. I want your body language to prophesy today. Can you do that? I want your body language to prophesy. Some of y'all say, I didn't know you could do that. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. You can do that. Uh huh. <laughs> Glory to God. Here's what I want you to do I want you to just make sure you got enough room. Make sure you got enough room. And then I want you to take your hands and put them in front of you like this. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Right? And I want you to just kind of move stuff out of the way. So just take this forward. What are you doing? You're pressing. Your body language is pressing. You're moving obstacles. The Bible says there's a great door and effectual, 1 Corinthians 16, 9. There's a great door and effectual open to me there, but there are many adversaries. So what are you doing? You're moving them out of the way. I press. Come on. I press toward the mark. The Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul was so intellectually gifted and so spiritually inundated with God's goodness, wisdom, and authority that he still recognized, you know what, I've, I've defeated some enemies, but there's, a, there's enemies in front of me that i got to keep pressing. Come on, just say press. There is a high calling. I dare say that if you've got breath in your lungs, you haven't made it yet. I know I haven't. Somebody said, well, you know, I, I'm, I, I've arrived. You have not arrived. There's no arrival in Christ. There is only growth. Amen. It's perpetual. It's eternal. God, I will stop. When we get to Jesus, when we, wait, what's, the, what's the song that says that, you know, when we get there, you know, 10,000 years, <laughs> God's still going to reveal how amazing he is and how glorious he is. So we will never arrive, but we are always pressing. Come on. Lift your hands before the Lord.